this hype makes me feel I should start with Dearly Beloved. <laughs> <laughs> and why not? Um, homeschooling, of course, uh, two years ago, did not have the resonance it has now. And certainly it didn't have the resonance it had in 18th and 19th century Ireland. Uh, so that gives me my starting point. Um, the, uh, the text, the great text, not just for Lefanu studies, but for 19th century Irish history generally, for homeschooling, is of course uh, to be found in 70 years uh, of Irish life. And in that, uh, we have a text from uh, the author about its, he has a lot to say, but this I think is the essence of it, and I've quoted it directly. And uh, apologies to those in the very last row, I tested it yesterday and it just doesn't quite, if you have good eyesight you'll have no problem, uh, but I don't. So it does bear though uh, repeating I think. In the year 1826, my father hadn't been appointed Dean uh, of Emily and Rector of Abington. We left Dublin to live in Abington in the county of Limerick. Our education, except in French and English, which our father taught us, uh, was entrusted to a private tutor, uh, an elderly clergyman, Stinson by name, who let us learn just as much, or rather as little, as we pleased. Uh, for several uh, hours every day, this old gentleman sat with us in the schoolroom. I'd be very interested to see, as I'm sure you would, the possible, the candidate schoolroom in the rectory later today. Uh, where we, he was supposed to be engaged in teaching us classic lore. Instead, of course, he was tying uh, flies for his fishing. The Mulcair and the Shannon being close by. Uh, he was very glad to go there a lot, and the lads too. Uh, fortunately, my father's library uh, was a large and good one, and uh, my brother spent uh, much of his time in poring over many a quaint and curious volume. It's a nice juxtaposition there. There's the swatty brother and the uh, jock uh, author, uh, looking back fondly on those uh, days. Uh, the next uh, piece, which in uh, 70 years, which I don't quote, is, you might say, chapter two of home education uh, or home schooling in the rectory. And that was when the boys went to Trinity, as David pointed out uh, in the previous talk. And in Trinity, uh, they went to Trinity infrequently. Uh, they went to register, to matriculate, they went to uh, meet tutors and to uh, uh, discuss reading lists and to sit exams. Uh, but they read their course, and that was the term, they read their course at home in the rectory under their father's supervision. Trinity had that arrangement in the 19th century. Uh, what were called country students could study at home and come to Dublin uh, for their examination. So there was a, uh, a part two uh, of, the, um, of the schooling, of homeschooling there. But the homeschool, what 70 years doesn't refer to is of course the homeschooling of their sister. Uh, she is entirely absent. Uh, so too, in terms of education, is the role of the mother. Uh, and it prompts the question, which in sense is answered, I think, for us. Uh, before they got to Abington, or as they arrived into Abington, uh, Abington uh, uh, they, they, were, they, were, they were young lads uh, in their, coming into their teens. Um, and uh, of course they had been schooled previously, uh, and the likelihood, and I have to emphasize the likelihood, is that their schooling at home was perhaps, in Phoenix Park, was probably from their mother. And, and I can say that, I say that simply because that was quite normal. Uh, a mother started off, uh, started her children with the alphabet, with little primers, with prayer, little prayer books, and later on, uh, uh, boys especially went to learn uh, 
uh, from uh, a parent or from a tutor. Uh, and of course, for some others, they went out to school. Uh, they, but the point I want to make is that at this stage in Ireland, at this time, uh, uh, homeschooling uh, was certainly uh, at a time when most people didn't go to school, including the wealthy. Uh, the, um, the home was, of course, the focal point. Now, I'm not making any distinction between book learning and the skills and the knowledge of everyday life as well. That too, of course, does and is part and, and has always been fundamental uh, part of a child's education upbringing, that part of homeschooling. But what this does is, I think it does give us uh, a context, uh, but one which I think we have to look critically at. And one way of leading into that is to go back to the period before uh, the arrival in Abington. Uh, I don't want to, of course, repeat any of the ground uh, dealt with so eloquently by David, uh, but my focus will be principally on Thomas Philip. Uh, the dad, the father, Lefanu. Uh, a picture where, from him as a young man in his 20s, uh, in the garb of a clergyman, and uh, a rough summary of his life. Uh, his birth in Dublin, uh, Trinity, which he probably, unlike his sons, attended quite uh, regularly. Uh, he lived just across the road, so to speak. He was, he was a neighbour, uh, and uh, he certainly would have attended lectures, uh, and he isn't registered as a, a home school, as a, a country registered student. Uh, he uh, entered at 15 and a half, 16, so he graduated at 20, and that was the norm. During the 19th century, the entry age to university and college tended to rise, and indeed it's still rising here uh, in this country. Uh, educated deacon and appointed to his first curacy. What did he do between college and his curacy at St. Mar Mary's? I hope I haven't. Uh, he uh, probably, like a lot of young graduates, hung around hung around at home, I was fed at home, uh, went out with the lads, uh, picked up part-time tutoring, uh, and probably the, if he was heading towards the church, which he was, and there was a tradition, of course, uh, uh, of uh, the church in his family. Uh, did I knock this off? No, it was me. Oh, no, sorry, it was a bottle, a bottle of water. Yeah, okay. Uh, he um, he, uh, he continued, um, yes, picking up some part-time teaching, tutoring. Uh, we don't know that much about it, uh, but he is appointed to St. Mary's. He's relatively young, and St. Mary's is an important uh, parish. Uh, it is, later on it would decline, it's, some of you will know today as a public house. It has been converted uh, into a pub in the 1980s and it's in Mary Street, Dublin. Uh, its graveyard is a public park. Uh, certainly at the time that Lefanu was a point curate, um, it was a fashionable church. Uh, the focus of fashion hadn't moved from the north side uh, yet to the south side. And uh, among its parishioners, um, the Guinness family, uh, certainly a lot of the high officials from Dublin Castle, uh, and people like the gardeners uh, and so on, uh, the people who made that part of modern Dublin. So, um, deacon there, uh, chaplain and superintendent, 
and note the title. It's quite, it seems, a complicated brief uh, at the Royal Military School. Uh, he took the MA uh, at Trinity, uh, then followed while chaplain uh, in the park. Um, two rectorships he picked up, one in Cork, one in here in Limerick, uh, and at 26, uh, sorry, 1826, at the age of 42, and that is pretty young. Uh, he's a dean by the standards of the time. I know we have young deans today, uh, but certainly in the 19th century, 42 was a good age to get a deanship. And then his death in Abington. So, so far, so conventional. It's a straightforward enough um, clerical career. The Lefanus didn't have land, uh, and uh, yes, they were part of. Uh, 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 an, an elite not in the centre of it and certainly not at the upper end of it or at the lower end of it uh, and they had as David pointed out the issue came up uh, money was always going to be an issue uh, but in terms of money he was doing well curacy chaplaincy two rectorships and deanship all by 42 his chapel or sorry his church St Mary's uh, designed in 1701 by Robinson, who designed the um, uh, Royal Hospital, and uh, the, um, he, like many, I don't want to suggest any amount of cynicism on his part, he married the boss's daughter, uh, Emma. So, uh, next slide. This, I think, was painted, two little miniatures, still in the possession of the family, painted at uh, the time of his, um, uh, at the time of their marriage. Uh, next. They married in 1811, the three children followed fairly quickly. Home was in uh, uh, Lower Dominic Street. The photograph taken by Morris West, uh, sorry, Morris, um, Morris West, well, uh, Morris Craig uh, in 1949. And as Morris pointed out, just one car in the street. And so in that sense, quite close to what it might have been in the left of Bay. And this is the house. Next one. Yes, just over that boy there. Fast. Alas, it's gone in most of the street. Uh, pulled down in the 1950s uh, and replaced with public housing designed by Desmond Fitzgerald. There's no plaque, there's no memorial. The Lewis passes by, but this time of the year at least, the locals, knowingly or otherwise, invoke the spirit uh, of Lefanu's past on their balconies. <laughs> Next. A move to the park. It was less than two miles away, but it was a world away. Uh, it's not rural Ireland, despite William Ashworth's wonderful painting. Uh, it's a made landscape, and it's very much a military landscape. Next slide. Uh, the looking up the Liffey, uh, towards the city, the recently built four courts, dome, island bridge, the military hospital, the military magazine fort, the Lord Lieutenant, who's commander in chief, his house, now our salute on, just over the hill there. Uh, Ashford, the artist, set up his easel uh, just down the hill slightly from the military school. Unfortunately, it's not included. But you can see now Ashford, the painting was commissioned by the Lord Lieutenant. Uh, he does capture the military mood and sense of the place. It's a made landscape, but it's also, I think, a military landscape. And the bazaars here 
out exercising uh, more soldiers here at the fort. Next. And this was a venue for, dare I say, homeschooling. Uh, the Royal Hibernian Military School. It was the home to uh, uh, a community, I'm not quite sure if it's the right term, but a population of perhaps up to 700 people. Uh, the central block designed by Tom Cooley, who designed Dublin City Hall in 1766. And the numbers were growing. Uh, initially, about 150 pupils, boys. Uh, by the time the Lefanus arrived, it was uh, 600. Uh, that's a massive expansion. So that brought its own tensions, rapid expansion. Expansion was probably brought about by uh, the wars of that time, the Napoleonic Wars in particular. Uh, there were lots of orphaned soldier children and, uh, and that was what the school was set up for. But by this time, by the 1820s, uh, it's, its role not just of looking after dead soldiers' children, but it was also a potential recruiting ground. And a new um, charter to the school in 1809 gave it a very specific brief. It was to be a preparation school, a feeder school, if you like, for the army. This wing was built to accommodate girls who were also, of course, orphaned, uh, but had been overlooked. But girls' schooling is on the rise at this time. The potential, the possibilities of school. And you can see Emma's schooling is in part of the text. Uh, uh, but that's at a time when girls' schooling is becoming something uh, of significance. So the school expands. This is a bit for girls. The staff are given a special wing here, and this is given over mostly to the boys, except for the commandant, who retains his rather palatial rooms uh, in the central block. Plans have survived, and uh, in uh, the staff block, uh, it's essentially a block of flats. In this case, are chambers or rooms, uh, all terms. The term flat isn't used, but chambers and rooms are used. It's just the original colour leaves here blue, uh, red, and buff. Uh, next slide. Uh, no, no. Uh, yes, the next slide is a close up of the set of rooms which were allocated to the chapel. Sitting room, parlour, kitchen. This is from the adjacent flat. So, this is the ground floor, the yard, and bedrooms above. It survives intact. Uh, it's now part of the administration wing of the um, uh, St. Mary's Hospital. The school survived until 1922. It was vacant, the Irish Army was in possession, and um, during the TB uh, uh, response of the 1940s, it became a fever hospital, a chest hospital, and uh, this became the administration wing. Uh, this is the staircase in what I believe to have been the official residence of the chaplain, still there today. Uh, you know, the woodwork is 18th century, or sorry, early 19th century woodwork. And this is the chapel where Tom uh, left a new, and using the Dublin pronunciation with all apologies to our honorary council. Uh, uh, his chapel. Uh, so that's the chapel he was the chaplain to, and it is uh, as it was, except the interior has been uh, changed to some extent. It became a Catholic chapel uh, 
in the, for the hospital in uh, the 1950s. Um, and plan. Now you see that this is a chapel for 200, not 700. And uh, that raises then and brings to the question uh, of what did he do uh, in this home to uh, a population of 700 people? What was Tom Lefany's role? Uh, in some ways it's all summed up in the motto of the school. Uh, Fear God and honour the King. Uh, to some extent, uh, that motto remains very much, I think, part of uh, the mission statement, if you like, of schools today, to inculcate values, possibly and maybe specifically religious values, and to be a good citizen. Uh, when we think of chaplains in schools, we think of the jolly priest who hops in occasionally to chat to the lads about their problems and take the odd class and is generally on hand to help with issues. Uh, he had 600 pupils, and, but he also had 45 of staff on the school and most of those were soldiers. Uh, and the staff had families and most of them lived in the school or in adjacent buildings. Like his own retinue, he was just the chaplain, but he but there was Emma and the three children. They were allocated two servants by the school and they paid for additional servants. I think their household was about 10. Uh, so you can see how the numbers could very, very, you know, it was a large parish. I use the word obviously. Uh, uh, in a very special sense. He had a second specific role. He was superintendent of education, so he wasn't just chaplain looking after spiritual matters. He was supposed to keep an eye, and in fact more than an eye, just an eye on the school. He was also given, I think, it becomes more difficult as you go down, I think. He had to supervise the morals. How do you supervise the morals of a staff of 45 soldiers? Uh, it was seen as an issue. They needed to be kept an eye on. Armies are ambivalent uh, about their chaplains. Uh, you know, a member of the army, but not a member of the army. Uh, the priest, but wearing a military uniform. Uh, and so on. Uh, there are all sorts of issues. Uh, uh, but I think the most important role he had was an informal one. It wasn't written down anywhere. Locally, uh, uh, a local pastoral role. It was the only church in the park. His was the only church in the park. The park contained the residences of the three most important civic figures in Ireland. The Lord Lieutenant, who was the King's deputy in Ireland. The Chief Secretary, who was head of government. And the Under Secretary, who was his deputy. They all had their residences. Respectively today, Arison and Theron, the American Embassy, formerly the Papal Nuncio, it's now um, uh, an interpretive centre. The Lord Lieutenant came to church every Sunday. And if we just go back, going to the plan of the church, uh, this one here, uh, two pews here, constructed, Lord Lieutenant here, uh, Chief Secretary here, uh, pulpit, presumably here. And I suspect the military head of the school sat there. It's not specified in the map. And this was, this church never expanded. I think at this stage, um, Lefanu's uh, uh, chaplaincy to the boys and girls 
was conducted either in the very large classrooms where he preached twice a week, where he took lessons in scripture, uh, and where, because of his role, just, yes, because of his role as superintendent of education, he really was expected to be in and out of the school all day, every day. A brief summary of, I think, critical final years, or sorry, critical years at the hospital. Now, the sharp eye will have spotted uh, maybe some anomalies here. I just want to explain it before we continue, and I'm coming to the conclusion. Uh, the appointment uh, was made in 1840, but he didn't arrive in the park until June 1815. So I don't don't, don't photograph this, I'll have to correct it before it goes into the public realm. And down here, uh, this too, this is the realm, there's at least two realms in every, in every talk. Uh, this should be 1826, but I'm just forewarning, you'll have spotted that, in, you'll spot that anyway. A summary here of a lot of clerical military politics. Um, and His main job, it's a full-time job, he's expected to be resident and he's expected to be present at all times except by permission of the commanding officer. Now he's second in command but every absence has to be cleared. Yet he takes on two sinecures, and as David pointed out, he dealt with that by appointing uh, curates. Our McGee in the Diocese of Cork and uh, Abington here. We know that he, because of the survival of the vestry group, we know that he did preach occasionally in Abington. He did come, he preached the records of the Sundays in which he preached, though most of the attendance was by the curate, Mr. Palliser. Uh, so, but he was away. And that caused problems. Uh, so much so that in 1824, the governors of the school ordered him uh, to give more attention to his duties. He was regarded as neglectful by 1824. Now, this is a man in his 30s. In 1821, his salary was reduced as was that of all the other senior officers. The period of retrenchment brought about by the ending of the Napoleonic Wars a few years before, and was massive, uh, extraordinarily economic crisis, much, much worse than anything uh, you or I have experienced in our lifetimes here. Uh, so it cuts all around, uh, but in truth, 250 to 100 uh, was extraordinary compared with what the others, the cuts for the others. Uh, I think he was a soft target. He was the, one, the only one on the staff who wasn't a soldier. Uh, uh, his, his, uh, his spiritual boss is the, is the Bishop of Dublin, the Archbishop of Dublin, uh, but his day to day boss is a military man. So there's tension there that I don't think was ever. Uh, properly provides. He appealed to the Lord Lieutenant. Remember, the Lord Lieutenant came to church every Sunday. So, and he was a frequent guest at official functions in the Vice Regal Lodge. I think that was a hugely important connection for him. He appealed and he gains, I think the unfairness was clear, and he does get uh, a partial, a, a pro rata uh, 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 improvement. But, in the sense they are worried. He's away a lot, he's not as active, he should have been in his 30s, um, maybe that's why he had been appointed. It was certainly the enormity of that task was a, a task for a young mission man. The appointment of this guy, Captain Michael Irving, is curious and most interesting. Irvine, he was a really hard working uh, officer who, like everything in writing, 
and report it back all the time. And you know, giving evidence to a government commission that looked at education throughout Ireland, the school wasn't being targeted, uh, he pointed out that uh, he's there only two or three days a week. Um, and if you read the whole report, there's a kind of a sneakiness I think in it uh, that isn't particularly attractive. On the other hand, uh, the chaplain's behaviour was certainly causing trouble. So, a man who might have had a leisurely or at least a more relaxed, informal life as a curate was in a very, very different context as a chaplain in what was, after all, a military establishment. Uh, he's, he gets a, a drastic cut, and he's the only one who gets the cut. They say, if you're going to be away, if you're rector of two other parishes, uh, we're not getting value for money, and they cut it uh, back to 100 again. And he's had enough, and he resigned, and he came uh, to Abington. Uh, and maybe that's a, the point at which we should, I should stop, because I have gone over the time. Thank you very much.